Often within adventure movies, the household hero will be traversing some deep, dark, ancient corner of our world, accompanied by a trusty flaming lantern, a light source which will often seemingly have an endless fuel supply. Additionally, the lamps which litter the walls of these elaborate film sets were presumably lit many hundreds, even thousands of years prior to our intrepid explorer's entry into the ancient booby-trap-laden lair. Many perceive these flaming props as mere stage trickery, a subtle showbiz deception, helping with the lighting of often dungeon-esque locations. Amazingly, however, it seems that these apparent ever-burning cave lanterns may have been included, by an astute understanding of as yet, unexplained historical realities. One Egyptian death tradition, a custom rarely shared academically, was the frequent placement of an eternal burning lamp somewhere inside the sealed chamber. How were ancients able to produce seemingly ever-burning lamps? Lamps which could burn apparently without fuel. Based on overwhelmingly large volumes of reports of their existence, discoveries in tombs, underground chambers, temples, and many other places dotting the entire earth, it's hard to see how these amazing light sources could have just been a mere rumor. Yet, unfortunately, or rather conveniently, not a single lantern is known to exist today for study. At times in human history, before the birth of particular global commercial agendas, inventors and pioneers of many scientific fields were encouraged, rather than stifled, into the investigation into the functioning of such ancient high technologies. During the Middle Ages, for example, 170 exploratory, in-depth reports surrounding these astonishing finds were published, most stating that they clearly demonstrated a valuable phenomenon. In the year 140, a lamp was discovered in the tomb of Pallas, son of King Evander. This light source had apparently been burning bright for over 2,000 years. Upon an in-depth examination involving a testing of the flame's robustness, it could apparently resist all ordinary methods of extinguishment. In about 1540, during the papacy of Paul III, a burning lamp was found in a tomb in Rome. The tomb belonged to the daughter of Cicero. She died in 44 BC, meaning this lamp had been burning in the sealed vault for 1,550 years, yet it strangely extinguished the moment it left the room. When King Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church in 1534, he ordered dissolution of monasteries in Britain. Many tombs were opened. In Yorkshire, a burning lamp was discovered in a tomb of Constantius Chlorus, father of the great Constantine. He died in 300 AD, which means that this lamp had been happily burning for more than 1,200 years. With such overwhelming numbers of reports, reliable testimonies attesting to the existence of these lamps, it's hard to see how they could just be a product of Hollywood. Regardless, it seems all have successfully been erased from public view, presumably hidden within the chasms of scientific institutions whose financial insurance policy is, unfortunately, often implicated in the concealment of historical artifactual evidence, physical objects in direct disagreement with their highly profitable yet shoddy foundation for scientific direction. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. The ancient mega metropolis of Guatemala, undoubtedly one of the most incredible and indeed one of the largest ancient ruins ever found on our planet. With a past population now believed to have been as many as 10 million people, Many of the ancient ruins within the Guatemalan rainforest, long thought and academically argued to have been separate settlements, have now been discovered to have once been all part of the same super settlement. However, although incredible discoveries have been made at the sites, in particular the incredible site of Tikal, including the ancient plaque depicting a seeming cataclysm, have all been found at the site. Yet what was discovered most recently is no less incredible and may also depict a war between these differing concentrations of people within its many ancient settlements. A giant frieze, or frise if you will, 8 meters wide and 2 meters tall, has been found within an ancient pyramid long hidden, buried within the rainforest, found along the exterior of a multi-roomed rectangular building within a 20 meter high pyramid. It was created in a style now long attributed to the Maya. The carving depicts human figures in a seemingly mythological setting, suggesting it may depict deified rulers. It displays three human figures wearing elaborate bird headdresses 
and jade jewels sitting cross-legged and appearing above the head of a mountain spirit known as a witz. A cartouche on the headdress contains glyphs which were used to identify individuals depicted by name. Yet, alas, only the central figure's name is still legible, with an inscription saying Och Chan Yopat, meaning the storm god enters the sky. Two feathered serpents are also shown emerging from a mountain, with a spirit below the main character forming an arch with their bodies. Much of the building in which the frieze was found still remains encased under ancient rubble, yet this has seemingly aided in the preservation of the incredible artwork, with the carving still possessing its paint, reds, blues, greens, and yellows, all still existing. Francisco Estrada Belli, director of the Holmu Archaeological Project, made the initial discovery. Quote, this is a unique find. It is a beautiful work of art, and it tells us so much about the function and meaning of the building, which is what we were looking for. End quote. Thanks to the artwork and the message it conveys, Archaeologists now believe it is evidence suggesting that the rulers of the region were once embroiled in a political clash of the Titans between the kings of Kanul, the Snake Kingdom, and the kings of Takal. And although we now know that these settlements, and indeed the depictions of these different apparent clans, were all connected, it could be indicative of the ultimate reason for the demise of this once great civilization. Are we looking at the only artwork ever discovered throughout Guatemala which sheds light on the demise of the mega-metropolis? We find the evidence to suggest so highly compelling. Although academia would like you to believe they possess a detailed, complete history regarding the construction of Easter Island, just like any other seemingly impossible site found around the world, any explanation as to how these supposedly documented events were indeed undertaken remains absent. We recently postulated that much of the ancient ruin that is Easter Island, and perhaps the most impressive features still to be found upon the island, are more than likely buried beneath past landslides once caused by rapid deforestation. And, as predicted, with this realized and archaeological excavations commenced, we soon knew just how deep this ancient sediment actually is, and as such, the controversial discoveries began to surface. Not only are there ancient Moai statues, stretching into the hundreds of tons of weight dotting the island, but how these were moved into position is knowledge lost to the chasm of history. However, although academia would like you to believe that these tasks were completed within the last thousand years, the evidence of a past advanced civilization actually having been responsible is all over the island. After shallow excavations were undertaken around Anahu, one of the many ancient ceremonial platforms, polygonal masonry, uncannily similar to that found within Giza, Peru, Bolivia, and indeed all other as yet unexplained sites around the world, was indeed unearthed. An additional piece of evidence we feel may one day help to eventually unravel the mystery of not only Easter Island, but many other ancient sites around the world, is in its past title. Once known as the Navel of the World, it is interestingly one of many. A number of other ancient sites, thanks to our own more modern ancestors, retain their ancient titles as navels. Were these ancient civilizations somehow able to tap into a mysterious energy grid that can be found crisscrossing our Earth? It is undeniable that many of the most ancient sites found all over the planet can be found located upon purported ancient energy lines. Were these placements a mere coincidence? Were they placed there for another reason? Or were they indeed tapping into an energy field which allowed them to shift such weights? Chipito Chenua is an intriguing artifact that can be found upon the island. With such an extremely well-preserved, untouched history found upon the island, Chipito Chenua is still remembered as an artifact once used by ancient elders used to summon something called mana, 
which interestingly translates as earth energy. These elders then inexplicably use this energy to float multi-ton statues across the coastline, placing them in their final resting places. Are all these connections, artifacts, and historical accounts mere coincidence? Or are we truly on to something? Only time will tell. There are many mysteries to be found within ancient Egypt. Unexplained, seemingly impossible mysteries which litter the caverns, tunnels, flooded underground layers, and indeed the once inaccessible passageways, only recently explored using advanced modern technology. However, some of the most perplexing mysteries lay in plain sight. Not only the Great Pyramids themselves, an obvious enigma for academia to explain the construction of, but many anomalous features which can be found within objects often leaving academics baffled as to an explanation. The Cheops sarcophagus being one such anomaly. Although these pyramids are entered and explored by millions of people every year, and indeed, this mysterious sarcophagus shown to many of these inquisitive explorers, what many the funded academic tour guide often leaves absent from their explanation of this supposed tomb is how exactly it arrived at its current location. As we have explored and exposed previously, the casing stones that can be found on many of the pyramids are to us not only indicative of another phase of construction work, once having been undertaken upon these structures, but due to the erosion present and the different styles featured, are in fact indicative of more than one attempt to conserve these marvelous structures for future generations. Thus, one must conclude by more than one now extinct advanced civilization. As such, the age of the sarcophagus of Cheops could be immense. So it is not surprising that it has encountered not only grave robbers, but has been vandalized also at points within the distant past. Furthermore, and perhaps most intriguing and frustrating, is that the sarcophagus lid is missing, a lid that could have explained the past contents of this mysterious box. Or like the tomb of Pakal, exposed extremely controversial illustrations of possible past technologies. Unfortunately, however, or rather most conveniently for academics, this lid has never been discovered. Yet what is most perplexing regarding this diorite box, notably one of the hardest workable stones on Earth, is that no one seems to know how the original builders managed to transport the box to its current location deep within the bowels of Cheops. The diameter of this supposed tomb, being too large to have traveled down any of the known tunnels, which have so far been discovered within the ancient pyramid. This leaves us with two likely possibilities. One, that the diorite box was placed there and the pyramid built around it, which is a mysterious and confusing hypothesis, mostly due to the lack of markings of significance found upon the sarcophagus, or indeed the lack of any dedicative markings found anywhere else surrounding it. It is as though the box was placed there without much effort to indicate any importance to its existence. Yet, to cut such a box, which has since been discovered to have been cast from one single block of diorite, would have taken tremendous effort a feat that modern man would only accomplish with the use of diamond-edged power tools. Not to mention the effort that would have been involved in moving this multi-ton stone into its found location. The second hypothesis regarding how this sarcophagus found its way into its current location is that the box itself was transported to its found location through tunnels and passageways we are yet to discover possibly hinting at the fact that within this Great Pyramid, there are indeed many more hidden layers and cavities we are yet to explore or discover. Maybe the placement of this seemingly inanimate box was placed there to suggest exactly this. Furthermore, what was on the lid of this supposed sarcophagus? Why is it known as the sarcophagus of Khufu, when Khufu was not discovered within it? In fact, nothing was discovered within it, 
and why is the lid mysteriously absent? Where did the lid to this sarcophagus go? Why, if destroyed by grave robbers, was it not left where it lay? Did this lid contain controversial information, possibly pertaining to the original contents or indeed purpose of the Great Pyramids? We find the diorite sarcophagus of Khufu, and indeed its unexplainable journey into the center of the pyramid, highly compelling. We have, on many occasions, covered the many astonishing ancient rock-cut structures which can be found virtually all over the world. Megalithic creations, often carved from a single piece of stone or dry-built, constructed out of impossibly huge stones, and recently, we have touched upon the more impressive stone sites to be found, such as the horseshoe-shaped piece of granite, decided upon by someone or something as the base rock for what many perceive to be the most impressive artistic wonder on Earth. A structure named after a mountain, we also suspect, has witnessed extreme excavation work in the past, as did the Giza Plateau. Indeed, although little known, acres of solid natural stone were excavated from the Giza Plateau as the foundation bed for the most incredibly elaborate pyramid found anywhere. Who could have accomplished such gargantuan tasks over 3,000 years ago? But I digress. Our topic of this video is a wonderful gem hidden upon our Earth. In fact, the largest and seemingly most impressive of them all. So impressive, in fact, a number of individuals, specialists, tasked with the investigation of this astonishing structure and the construction thereof. Some for over 12 years of extensive investigation have been resigned to the conclusion alien influences could have only been responsible for the completion of the structure at such an ancient time in our history. Known as the Lost City of Angkor, this due to its extended duration hidden beneath several thousand highly established tree roots. It was once the capital city of the Khmer Empire, which flourished from approximately the 9th to 15th centuries. However, a similar theory can be applied regarding the Khmer Empire's success to the ancient Egyptian civilization's notorious longevity. It is, of course, a possibility that we have covered regarding Giza before, that these ancient cultures partook in probably the earliest form of graffiti, presumably ordered by the current rulers to add their own deity depictions to these already ancient and astonishing structures. It would be a logical decision for a successful leader of an ancient group of people, namely self-declared Hindu monarch Jayavarman II, who also declared himself a universal monarch and a god-king, to make the decision to claim such mastery as their own creation. When visitors entered the area, they would immediately assume that your group had constructed this awe-inspiring temple, undoubtedly intimidating and additionally giving incredible security to your people, as the temple even possessed an impressive moat, an instant advantage over all surrounding tribes. Not hewn from a single rock, but created using no less impressive techniques, undoubtedly requiring the same perfection in artistic ability as Kailash Temple. Five million blank stone blocks were perfectly laid upon one another, slowly forming a template. These stones were then individually and perfectly carved into the astonishing wonder we see before us today. As the blocks were pre-laid, this means whoever the sculptors were had only one chance to get the carvings right, a feat they seemingly accomplished. Who built the lost city of Angkor? Kailash? The pyramids? Baalbek, etc., etc.? The list of utterly perplexing sites grows every day, but thankfully, so does our knowledge. Ayandara, a site covered in the past, yet for an entirely different reason. Our experience along this path of discovery, now allowing one a window, a glimpse, into a deeper, more compounding layer of evidential detail unraveling a tangled web of lies, weaved over generations of regurgitated fiction, accompanied by supportive evidence to again reinforce the original instinctual hypothesis created some ten years ago now, in particular in regard to who could have, in reality, 
possibly created these mind-blowing or gargantuan ancient megalithic ruins. Sites we have touched upon or researched in the past, however from a less experienced evidential angle, thus we feel they are justified a refined revisit. Yet I digress. Ayandara is a claimed Iron Age settlement, yet what I am about to demonstrate is that not only is this yet another lie, but that the evidence be overwhelming to support this claim. The choice of stone used in these once exquisitely finished ruins decoration, for example, not only reminiscent of Persepolis, but due to its clearly much greater level of erosion, it would also, as the art would suggest, far predate Persepolis itself. Yet the belief structure, the artistic evolution, and by default, the same civilization responsible for both and indeed the mythological depictions are undeniably linked. Ayandara being located in Syria and claimed as dating as far back as the Iron Age. We have covered the magnificent Lamassu, found within Persepolis within a two-part special previously. This extraordinary, seemingly superhumanly precise stone-carved sanctuary, however, although clearly possessing a more advanced depiction of the same creatures found at an apparent Iron Age basalt site, which is actually geographically over 1500 kilometers away and dated to a completely different era, regardless of academic opinion, share unarguable evidential similarity and due to erosion levels can be correlated with the evolution of the depictions along with the civilization responsible's past yet now lost abilities. From Ayandara to the Lamassu of Persepolis is clearly an artistic evolution of the mythical creatures depicted on the basalt stones claimed as Iron Age within Ayandara. Furthermore, although only a suspiciously tiny portion remains of the basalt floor, a quietly guarded area found at the foot of Cheops upon the Giza Plateau, or more accurately foundation, although only a remnant of what once was probably one of the most significant parts of the ancient ruins themselves, it still holds countless undeniable curious tool marks, each of which clearly made with a tool unarguably tremendously more powerful and capable than that of what academics claim the builders of the pyramids and their constructors wielded, that of copper tools. It all but now seems an insult to one's intelligence. We clearly find Ayandara highly compelling. When people visit the southeastern Anatolian province of Mardin, this gem of lost antiquity quietly sits, often overlooked, and when one begins to investigate said site, they are often left with more questions than answers. For why does such an astonishing ruin go largely unnoticed? Why is it not more largely discussed within archaeological circles? Could it be due to the fact, as one with any level of knowledge regarding lost civilizations and the proof therein latches eyes upon the site, they instantly recognize its characteristics synonymous with these studies, matching other, yet rather interestingly, accidentally revealed ruins from around the world? The style of, and the decision to bore the dwellings from solid stone, reminiscent of many unexplained ruins such as the underground city of Derinkuyu, a particularly interesting site when indeed discovered entirely by accident, one which to this day remains heavily debated and to some highly controversial. This site, known as Dara, is exhibiting geological processes which are now, unfortunately, beginning to erode it back into the landscape. The construction technique, however, still testament to its original builder's abilities and indeed its possible age. Yet this does not answer the question as to why this ruin goes largely untalked of, largely unstudied and overlooked. For parallel to the erosion argument exhibiting its true age, it can also be used as an advocate for its official dating within the Byzantine era. The lack of surviving ruins will often be used as a way to dismiss such claims of antiquity due to a lack of evidence. Thus, 
we wanted to dig a little deeper to see if, via visual evidence, we could confirm that there is indeed reason to suspect that the site could possibly generate controversy for those who originally dated the site. This to confirm our initial suspicions. Still, surviving tool marks present upon the stones match that of other controversially dated sites. How can a ruin apparently dating from the Bronze Age exhibit such long cut marks or finishes across the stone? Like that of the ancient pyramids, how could copper tools have accomplished such feats within Dara, Giza, and the other sites around the world? It is a question which we find highly compelling. Here at Mystery History, we cover the unexplained areas of antiquity, either ignored, avoided, dismissed, or simply given an incomplete or often illogical historical lifeline of existence by mainstream academia, particularly those which we have covered of significant size, quarried from many miles away, now often immovable, and once transported, and either erected or placed atop one another seemingly effortlessly. We were, in a past series of investigations, looking into an interesting quarry within the Bazda cave system on the edge of Turkey, a place with particularly good granite and a proven source of stone for numerous megalithic sites many miles around. Later, proven by us via the preserved linkages in tool marks to have been used by more than one group, as if they had coalesced at this particular site. Yet, as mentioned, we have long argued that not just one advanced civilization capable of moving and cutting these incredibly monumental megalithic stones have been and gone, and we feel we have and continue to provide sufficient proof of these claims. The Colossi of Memnon, said to have once sang at sunrise, are both made of stones thousands of tons in weight, yet are eroding to dust along with countless others, yet clearly once precisely cut, just like all the other stone ruins we cover worldwide. Yet sites like Petra and the polygonal casing stones found in some most curious of places such as the pyramids of Egypt, preserving stones in a similar condition to the Colossi. Certain stone monuments of gigantic size, found and stored in near-perfect condition, are found in these same areas, as if somehow spared catastrophe. Does this prove a sudden great flood? They regardless, we claim, prove several cycles of activity at stone-cutting creation. Were some monuments submerged and therefore preserved under the sediments? like those secretly removed from the pyramids and sphinx during initial investigations? Were they attacked by a geological event? The perfect preservation of some of these statues must eliminate sandware as a possibility. The pursuit to the answers to these questions become closer, and we feel highly compelling. One of the things crucial for any civilization to flourish is a steady and abundant supply of clean, fresh water. It is the lifeblood of our planet, arguably the most fought-over resource on Earth. Without it, crops fail, sewage is not effectively flushed away, and a lack of it will cause dehydration and death in an incredibly short space of time, depending on where one were to find themselves. Thus, for our posit of ancient, advanced civilizations, with populations well into the millions, to hold any water, a civilization we believe continues to bestow upon us advanced knowledge, ingenious solutions to the most difficult of problems, such as water manipulation and the irrigation thereof, would be present. The management and general manipulation of water should in all accounts be present amongst these sites in which we claim to be the work of now lost civilizations, and that is indeed what one finds. There is endless discussion within peer-reviewed papers and academic circles by regurgitation, seemingly lacking the faculty for critical thinking as they continue to look upon these ingenious ancient solutions for getting water to places that it should simply not be as simply wonderful, 
all incapable of considering that these people who created these structures, although they did not build skyscrapers, may not have been of a primitive nature, with far less capable tools than modern man. This, again, I might add, a denial continued when one looks upon the size of megalithic blocks moved through these lost ages of antiquity. Yet, I digress. The following ancient water technique is nothing short of astonishing, and the work that must have gone into its construction unimaginable. Not surprisingly, it is an ancient marvel that did not escape the attention of William R. Corliss. Known as canats, they are literal underground ancient man-made rivers, built slightly underground for the purposes of shade from the searing sun, found in most of the locations you find the canats. This, of course, also minimized evaporation considerably, inevitably allowing the water to travel unimaginably further into dry and inhospitable locations. These ancient man-made oases, yet another example of not only ancient man's abilities, knowledge, and dedication to overcome obstacles, but also a clue as to how many people these, what we believe are now lost civilizations who abruptly vanished, housed at an unknown time in history. For such enormous volumes of water are only needed for an equally enormous population, possibly once located somewhere nature wouldn't have allowed. Yet with their advanced knowledge of irrigation systems, they flourished within. Kanats are yet another incredible remnant left by an advanced civilization, which we undoubtedly find incredibly compelling. Previously, we covered the strange but highly intriguing Cockno Stone, an extremely ancient and very large Scottish stone covered with some of the best and most interesting ancient petroglyphs known in Europe. And although we put forward the preposition of it possibly being a map of as yet unknown star constellations, we were subsequently contacted by an independent researcher known as Sean Moriarty, who, with a small independent team, has been investigating the stone for quite some time, resulting in them deciphering the enigmatic cup and ring marks as a map of all the ancient sites within the surrounding area, including some yet to be unearthed. However, there is a little less known ancient stone, a stone which rests in North Carolina, deep within the mountains of Jackson County, and it has baffled all but a few who've examined it. Known as the Judicula Rock, it is a soapstone boulder covered with a plethora of strange petroglyphic drawings that archaeologists now believe to be over 3,000 years old. The native Cherokee Indians consider the site sacred and state that it's extremely ancient. The rock has been studied by researchers from across the world, but no one was ever able to decipher the bizarre petroglyphs on the stone, not even being able to connect them vaguely to any usual subject matter often selected for such ancient expressions. It's also cut using an unknown technique made by an unknown people. The stone sits at the base of a mountain that has a large vein of copper which runs under the site. With a variety of other rare metals and minerals present, this geological layout has often been used to explain the strange electromagnetic anomalies which can be detected around the rock. The League of Energy Materialization and Unexplained Phenomena Research, or LEMA for short, a team of highly qualified individuals who explore paranormal and enigmatic subjects may have actually cracked the code, and their research is certainly the most compelling proposition so far put forward, or quite possibly will ever be put forward. In August of 2002, Lima investigated Judicula rock. Upon comparing Judicula's markings to microscopic forms, specifically microscopic pond life, some of which exclusively native to the surrounding landscape, an artistic relationship becomes undeniable. Modern academia, or indeed known history, states that man first saw microscopic creatures in September 1674. These observations were made by Dutch scientist Anton van Leeuwenhoek. That means humans have only known of microscopic life for less than 330 years. If this is true, who or what could have created the Judicula stone's markings over 3,000 years ago? Was this stone made by a highly advanced ancient alien? 
Was it made with the purpose of sharing their research with a local population unable of such work? To date, the Lima theory is the only one which has been successfully corroborated elsewhere. <laughs>